So thanks for returning. And um, we're really excited to have this second panel on ensuring health and livelihoods of communities and farm workers facing drought impacts. Um, this is, of course, is an absolutely critical issue. There are huge human costs to our current drought and to the lack of resilience in our farming systems. So um, we feel that this is an incredibly important issue to address. I, I'm going to start by introducing our um, moderator, Maria Echeveste, who we're so proud to have as being part of the Berkeley Food Institute. And she's a policy and program director, development director um, at the Chief Just at the Chief Justice Earl Warren Institute on Law and Social Policy at UC Berkeley, sorry. Um, and she served as assistant to the president and deputy chief of staff to President Bill Clinton. So we're really honored to have Maria here today. She has many um, amazing responsibilities and roles um, and positions of honor. And she's also worked as a community leader and corporate attorney. Um, she's the non-resident fellow of the Center for American Progress, working on issues such as immigration, civil rights, education, and Latin America. And you can see um, many of her other honors. And uh, again, we're really privileged to have Maria working with us at the Berkeley Food Institute on our executive committee. Thank you. So with that, I'd like to welcome Maria and the panel. She'll introduce the rest of the people. Absolutely. Thank you, Ann. So, um, Really excited to, to be here and to have this panel follow the earlier one because we are trying to demonstrate through this programming just how important it is to think about all the aspects in a community. Uh, it's that uh, old li uh, the line from uh, No Man is an Island. Well, no industry, no, no activity is, is by itself, right? So um, let me first introduce uh, from my right to the left, continuing that way, um, are panelists. So Sara Ramirez um, is the executive director of Food Link, um, Tulare County. And by the way, I am you have their bios in the program, so I'm not I'm, I'm interested in making sure we start this conversation. So you could, but they're quite, quite impressive, all of them. And then um, to her right is Janaki Jagannath, who is a community legal worker with California Rural Legal Assistance. Um, for those who don't know, CRLA is legal services um, for farm workers and rural communities um, over 35 years. Um, and then uh, at, next to her is Jenny Rempel, who's the communications and development coordinator of the Community Water Center. So before um, I turn to each of the panelists, uh, as before, we're going to ask for them to make some short presentations and then try to start a conversation and then encourage you to ask some questions. I came to this issue of food and food systems um, from the perspective of farm workers having grown up in the Central Valley and Ventura County. And then ultimately, uh, what brought me and interested in this particular panel was the, how often the human impact of disasters, such as freezes or flooding or droughts, how often the, the farm workers, the communities, the non-farmers are ignored or not part of the discussion when we're talking about disaster relief. And that came home to me when I was at the Department of Labor and also in the White House when the Central Valley had a very serious freeze that affected uh, the citrus crops. And because I happened to know the valley, had a certain um, awareness of the conditions affecting farm workers, people I knew reached me in both the Department of Labor and subsequently in, Wash in the White House to ask, well, as they're talking about disaster relief, what about us? Is there something that can be done? Um, and it began a discussion about, well, how do you take into account when you have these um, changes that affect uh, the, the farmers, the, ag the, the grower community, but it has this ripple effect. So, I haven't stayed on top of coming up the policy implications since then. Uh, and so I'm really excited to hear from each of our panelists um, how the, you develop and how do you nurture resiliency 
and equity in our food systems for um, rural communities and workers. In the community. So I'll start with Sarah. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So I'm going to hopefully address the question that was just posed about how we're building resiliency, but also plant some little food for thought bombs among you, uh, hopefully to stimulate some conversation when we're done here. So I wanted to start off by my position as the executive director of Foodlink for Tulare County is fairly new. I've only been at Foodlink the last eight months. Prior to being at Foodlink, my husband and I started a grassroots organization that really our focus was to address resiliency in our community around food and food systems. We actually started a countywide gleaning project that over the last three years, we've probably gleaned um, close to 120,000 pounds of fruit, mostly from backyards, but from some farm as, farms as well. We have initiated a community garden in our hometown of Pixley, which is actually where we grew up and where we chose to move back to. It's, it is a small, unincorporated, uh, highly impoverished town, primarily of agricultural workers as well. And we also have uh, food and nutrition classes. My background is in public health, and that's part of what I'm bringing now to the food bank, because we're talking about moving our food bank into um, making it a hub of all healthy food resources, right? We're talking about how do we move families from being food insecure, hunger, malnourished, experiencing hunger, experiencing malnourishment, and transitioning them into food secure. A lot of that is impacted by income, which right now as we're talking about drought, we're seeing, okay, decreased ag production perhaps, decreased work in the packing houses means fewer jobs means less income for those families that normally work in those communities and in those jobs, means higher food insecurity. So now we've got families that are having to decide between food, medications, housing, clothes for children, utilities, and at the same time, we're experiencing a drought. We live in a county, and I think my co-panelists will be able to talk about some of the challenges with water specifically. We're living in a county where more than 900 wells are dried. So now are we throwing in the purchase of water into that equation too, so that we're dealing with family medic food, medications, housing, clothing, utilities, and water? And does that also impact food insecurity in our, in our community as well? Because our families having to make these tough choices of where to divide their small amounts of income, given the lower jobs and the lower household income coming in, are they having to divide that to more places? So we're seeing at the food bank as well increased numbers of individuals utilizing food, um, food assistance, emergency food assistance programs. We're very grateful for the drought food assistance that has been delivered to the Central Valley and to other communities like ours. These are shelf-stable products. Usually what we're seeing in these boxes are um, dried beans, rice, oatmeal, spaghetti, um, peanut butter, I think they added dry, uh, dried, um, dried milk and, uh, and canned chicken. There's, there's a couple of vegetable items. You know, when we're talking about some of our communities, we have to also look at that package. What is being delivered? Is this a product that is, say, culturally appropriate, culturally um, sensitive to the ethnicities that are represented in our community? This is great food assistance. Um, are we able to... Uh, teach our communities to utilize these resources better so that they're able to stretch their budget. This is something that we're working with right now and challenged with as well. But as we're talking about this drought funding, you know, there's a lot of attention going to drought assistance for farmers and agricultural production right now, and, and the main focus has been water. We know that our funding available for drought food assistance will only go to October. What's gonna happen after October if there aren't some other policy and advocacy efforts changing that to expand that into other periods or perhaps thinking of, of more um, other sustainable types of resources? I don't think that just simply sending food down in boxes is as sustainable as we might think. So we need to think about uh, those sustainable resources. I think the drought for us at the food bank 
also presents an opportunity to rethink our food security safety nets, right? So food banks, I think, are in an, an interesting location. Human services, social services, we're um, sort of at the crux of public health because we do provide a saf safety net to make sure that people aren't um, malnourished or undernourished or experiencing hunger. And yet at the same time, we also work closely with the agricultural community and sometimes receiving product that would normally go into the food waste stream by making sure that it comes out of that waste stream or gets diverted from the waste stream and disseminated into the communities that need the food. So we have this, we're in this interesting position. Um, we need to think about working towards um, nutrition for the life course for all people across all sectors of ages. But it also means that we might need to think about um, how we incorporate ag literacy and food literacy into our programs too, bringing back some of the um, preservation skills. And when I talk about preservation skills, again, I want to mention the, the cultural sensitivity. There are some very indigenous knowledge, indigenous practices of how to grow food, of how to preserve food, that sometimes because that has been obtained through experience or through informal education, it is sometimes overlooked by those of us who have more formal training. So, but the reality is that we, our communities sometimes come from hostile and dry environments that might actually be able to provide us some knowledge as well. So how do we learn? And, um, you know, again, thinking, we were talking about it a little bit earlier in the last panel about thinking diversity of ag. Um, you know, diversity of ag production means, at least for me, when I look at my community, potentially in diversifying the income sources for community members so that we're not relying solely on one type of crop or a mono type of crop. We have multiple crops. We're not forcing people to move to follow crops into different areas. We might actually be able to provide that basic livelihood, economic livelihood within our community. So really thinking about diversifying our ag at the local level, diversifying economic resources, I think one of the things that we often overlook when we're talking about ag, I, I ask my teenagers, the teenagers that volunteer with us a lot about this, and I talk to adults about it too, is like, and, and I should say, share the story that several years ago when I was first doing my uh, doctoral work, I went to conferences with farm workers and whatnot, and they would, they would say to me exactly what I'm gonna say to you now which is we want to change the image of farm work and farm labor. And this was coming from farm workers themselves who felt there was a shame, a stigma associated with the type of work. And that is almost learned. Um, my teenagers often, we, we have conversations about um, being ashamed of where our parents come from or how our parents tell us, you know, you don't want to follow in my footsteps. We want you to do something else, do something better. And so as we're thinking about um, food systems and food system resiliency and justice and equity, let's also talk about how do we value the knowledge, the people, um, the skills, that experience that's, that gets overlooked so much. I'll leave that, hopefully, some remarks there. Thank you, Sarah. Um, John? Yeah, thank you, everyone, uh, for inviting me to be here and for hosting this panel. Um, my name is John Ickey, and I work with, for California Rural Legal Assistance. How many of you have heard of us before? Yeah, all right. So um, we have offices all across the state, 22 offices, and we work primarily on worker protections and um, ensuring fair standards uh, for, in, in particular in my case, we work for ensuring fair standards of living for farm workers in their communities. That includes um, access to potable drinking water, basic infrastructure, housing, uh, and those, those sorts of basic necessities. And I'm excited to talk with you about resilience in the Central Valley because um, to me, the Valley has always been resilient. It's been founded uh, on, on resiliency, essentially. And these communities that I work in, particularly, um, which we call disadvantaged, unincorporated communities, 
or colonias are uh, areas of farm workers that have been historically neglected by cities. They have been unannexed and they're, they're unincorporated, so meaning that they often don't have access to um, city water, they don't have access to the basic city services, and um, they are essentially vestiges of a kind of anarchic development of our state. Back in uh, the 19, late 1920s and 1930s when folks came over from the Dust Bowl, sort of like our, our, our form of climate migration, um, they set up these shanty towns across the state. And these were largely uh, Caucasian people who came from Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, um, in that region looking for agricultural work. And there are people who did mostly um, labor that required them to stand up. So it's picking fruit from trees or packing. Um, stooped back labor was largely done by communities of color that actually were living in enclaves um, and were, were cut out of um, were cut out of actually being able to set up their own uh, living areas. But these sort of shanty towns or colonias were created by uh, Dust Bowl immigrants. So when those folks left to um, fight in the war, they're essentially the communities of color that picked up the stooped labor as well as the standing labor moved into those communities and they were sort of built on and built on with guerrilla water systems, guerrilla electricity, um, kind of vigilante justice at times. I mean, really, in th there are these um, communities that are representative of both a cultural character of our state, but also sort of a, a, the fact that the government has, has turned a blind eye to our agricultural communities over the course of time. So today, these are the communities that are suffering the most acute uh, the disadvantages of the drought, as well as the most acute health hazards that come along with climate change. Um, and they're afforded an interesting moment in history where we're able to see that they, they can really take a couple of different routes. I mean, we have the opportunity to learn from these spaces as agricultural workers who carry with them a great horticultural and agricultural knowledge and ability to actually author a different future for our state. Um, or we also have the opportunity to continue to uh, turn a blind eye to them and allow their communities to continue to dissolve. And um, I think the drought has really peeled back the layers around that. And we're, we're seeing that these communities are really requiring assistance in certain ways um, from the Department of Water Resources and from other state agencies to ensure equitable access to water. And then in other ways, we're also seeing that they're also the practitioners of some of our incredibly innovative water conservation practices on account of the fact that water has never been potable or abundant for them. Um, so I'm excited to talk to you a little bit more about that. And hopefully, whatever questions you have will come out um, of the audience. and. Um, that I'll pass it on to Jenny. Great. Go ahead. Thank you. Well, I'm Jenny Rempel, and as uh, was mentioned, I work at the Community Water Center. And at the Community Water Center, or CWC, we believe that everyone should, as a right, be able to turn on the tap and drink a glass of water and not have to worry about their health or safety, um, or worry that drinking that water will make you sick. But unfortunately, today, uh, in California each year, well over a million Californians don't have that right. Um, we have water that may not be safe to drink or even safe for bathing or cooking purposes. So at the Community Water Center, we've been working for over a decade to ensure that all Californians and all communities are guaranteed the human right to water. So we work primarily with low-income, rural, very small communities, largely farm worker communities, Latino communities in the Central Valley. We have a grassroots base in the South San Joaquin and Tulare County, Fresno, Kern, Kings counties, um, but do some work statewide as well to advance a policy agenda that really ensures that all Californians have the right to safe, clean, and affordable drinking water. And, and to do that, we organize, educate, and advocate. And the, dra the drought really came across our radar very strongly uh, 
most intensely last summer. As was mentioned, thousands of wells have gone dry across California, and this summer, thousands more wells will inevitably fail. We know this is going to happen, and the most extreme and acute impacts are felt in these same small rural communities, where in the most intense uh, situations or the worst situations, you have a complete loss of household water. So there are homes in Tulare County where um, you need to have a bottle or a bucket of water to be able to make coffee, to wash dishes, to flush the toilet, or even simply to wash your hands. And it's, it's residents who are reliant on private wells and state small water systems, which are water systems with less than 15 connections that are often most vulnerable to the drought because they lack access to the state funding streams that enable them to build resilient and functioning water systems. And these are most often in the communities that both um, of these wonderful women have characterized um, in these, um, at the state level, the term is disadvantaged, unincorporated communities. Um, but really just low-income rural communities that uh, lack safe drinking water and have had water quality issues for decades in some cases and now are completely out of water. So at the Community Water Center, we're working both to um, promote an immediate re response to this emergency, but also to put in place some more proactive policies that will make sure our communities are more resilient to future droughts and, and future climate emergencies like this. So um, to, to advance our dialogue about how to create more healthy and resilient communities, I'll share just a couple of stories and, um, and then some of the policy changes that, that have been made in, in recent weeks, because it's been a lot, of, a lot of activity recently at the state level, and what's, what's still needed if we really want to, to ensure that all Californians are guaranteed the human right to water and um, we create more resilient communities. So, um, we have, we have residents who are on private wells across the state, but feeling it most intensely in the San Joaquin Valley that are, in some cases, just running completely out of water. It's, it's communities like Easton or Orange Center in um, Fresno County, but all the way up to the foothill counties of the Sierra Nevadas. As was mentioned in Tulare County alone, you have almost 1,000 dry wells. 600 wells um, have gone dry in East Porterville alone, another unincorporated community, um, where almost 1,000 residents have no running water, and it's um, been that way for six months, or sorry, eight months. Um, but we're also seeing situations in communities like Poplar, which is a very small community of 2,500 residents in Tulare County as well, where the drought is actually exacerbating underlying water quality challenges. So they're a small community. They have three wells for the community, and um, we're forced to actually turn and, and start using water from that third well because groundwater levels were dropping, and that third well they've known for a long time is contaminated with exceedingly high levels of nitrate. So we're not just seeing wells going dry, we're also seeing and predicting more instances of water quality challenges being exacerbated by the drought. And in terms of, in terms of um, what's been happening at the state level recently, there have been some major changes in terms of um, accelerating funding. We've seen Prop 1 funding accelerated to these communities and some new set-asides, certainly not enough, for, but um, a step in the right direction for food assistance, um, as well as direct water relief and some emergency planning services. And one very small and wonky piece is the creation of a new Office of Sustainable Water Solutions that's really going to focus on these issues in small rural communities and try to develop more comprehensive solutions. But in order to advance, um, to, to really work more proactively to a situation where we have resiliency in these communities and we have drought resilience communities, we need to expedite and strengthen our groundwater management. And we had a huge step in the right direction last year with the passage of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. But we need to ensure that that is implemented quickly, but in a way that also has a place at the table and a supported place at the table so that community residents who are feeling these impacts of water mismanagement so intensely are able to participate in that decision-making process. And, and one piece of that um, is even just making well log data available. So some of the very important information for how we even um, characterize groundwater aquifers is not made public in California. It's the only state in the West that doesn't do that. Um, but along with focusing on, on our groundwater management, there's a real need for investment in job retraining programs, um, as well as some, some land use restrictions moving forward. Um, but uh, to, to really get at the whole 
um, the, the larger issue of, of water quality and how we address these health impacts and community resiliency impacts of um, water quality in California, we need a comprehensive program at the state level that is focused on how to create permanent, sustainable drinking water solutions for all Californians. So uh, I really look forward to, to your questions and to engaging in some dialogue around how to create more drought resilient communities. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I think there is so much to talk about. I'm going to try to get us started um, by uh, suggesting that one of the challenges, whether it's transforming our food system, um, and obviously water is a key component of that, is that it almost seems overwhelming because there are so many different levels of government and institutions and organizations involved. Um, and so I was struck with Janaki's, Janaki's um, reminder of the history of how these unincorporated areas um, came about, because we all recall you know, Grapes of Wrath and, and, and the fact that here we are, you know, what, 70, almost, yeah, 75 years later, um, almost 85, I guess. At any rate, I've forgotten my math. Um, so one, one question would be, is given the fact that these areas still are unincorporated, um, what, if anything, uh, are you all thinking about or ideas about? Um, would the solution of an Office of Sustainable Water Solutions, how would that potentially impact um, these, these areas, which are feeling the most effects, if you will, of this water shortage? Well, I think I'll begin by saying that um, something that Community Water Center as well as uh, CRLA work on is ensuring that these emergent uh, legislations are, are accountable to these farm worker communities, and particularly with the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, we're looking to ensure that the correct faces are at the table to create um, these, what are called joint powers authorities, which are going to be the actual authorities that oversee creating a sustainable groundwater management plan. The, the intention of that is that everybody is supposed to be invited. And we would hope that there will be the farm worker voice that you know, comes from community-based organizations like us to, to be able to implement that. But I think um, by hearkening back to our history and the unincorporated community history of California, what I was getting at is that um, we have a governance structure around water that has, it's, it has been created to essentially cut out these communities. And it's no coincidence that the governance structure is so complex and that it, it creates an issue for even an urban population to get even slightly versed in the amount of different agencies there that, are, uh, that are implicated in water management. And um, I guess maybe to provide a, a run, sort of like an overview, you know, when you drive down the state through the Central Valley, you're essentially driving through a series of s small kingdoms of water, they're water districts. And they're, um, they're these areas that don't have any real marking to them. You wouldn't know that you're passing from one to another. But they're um, governed by, often by five people. And we have, um, in California Water Code, we have three different varieties. We have private ones whose entire responsibility is to make money off of the sales of water. We have public ones that are, um, they're kind of run the way any normal lo local governance is where everybody can vote, everybody within the jurisdiction can vote about water, ma the management, the movement, the development of infrastructure. And then we have pseudo public private ones that you might be confused by because they have a .gov website, but anybody who lives within the jurisdiction couldn't run uh, to be on the board because you have to be a landowner to, to run um, or to be elected onto that board and to make decisions about what happens with that water. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are like, well, we have the 14th Amendment, like one person, one vote kind of thing, but we, we have a system in place in California around water that cuts out certain populations of non-landowners from making decisions about our water. Um, and it's a, it's a chronic problem for a lot of our communities to, to be able to surpass that and to, to create resilient solutions um, when we are really asking for a large political overhaul here. Well, that then raises um, to me, um, Sarah, you've done a lot of work at the local level, and you've described in your presentation um, 
the, the, some of the challenges of what it means to be on the ground as people are facing these issues. So um, at the local level, how do you intersect with what certainly seem to be very complicated and almost overwhelming obstacles to having a, a more equitable water system? You know, at, representing the food bank, so I um, participate on our drought, our local drought water task force. So our county has actually been very active in creating a, a drought operation system. We meet on a monthly basis. We have all the various partners represented mm -hmm. at this, everything from um, city officials to fire department. And, and so part of my role there is to remind everyone involved as we move forward and we begin to implement, whether it's you know starting to talk about desalination plants, partic particularly in places like Porterville or East Porterville, or um, water resources and transporting resources, making sure that, that our food pantries are connected to those resources as well. So food pantries where they are reporting dry wells in the community, I get resources from the county to make sure that those pantries have a way of um, disseminating information among the clients and participants to make sure that they can access these water resources depending on where they are. So uh, we have a lot of other community-based organizations who are also par part of this drought task force mm -hmm. and giving voice. Maybe they're doing some of the field work in terms of collecting survey data on how many people and how many homes are being impacted in these communities. And so we are trying to work together. I don't know how broadly that is happening in other regions of the state. I don't can, can anyone? Yeah, I'll chime in and just say that I think actually this is an instance where Tulare County has really taken the need in part because it is the epicenter of this crisis. Mm. Um, the state actually, one of our big policy asks right now is that the state simply monitor where wells have gone dry and ideally monitor where wells are likely to go dry. And there's no state data on that. Tulare County, as I know it, is the only county that's even tracking well failures or private residential well failures and has the best infrastructure set up right now um, in terms of an emergency response. Um, so I think that that's actually one place where we could learn and, and hopefully replicate at the state level just some of the basic data tracking and monitoring and prediction work that um, has, has been going on in Tulare County. But I wanted to, to back up to your earlier question about the Office of Sustainable Water Solutions and just share that as both Janaki and Sarah mentioned, I think the challenge of achieving community resiliency um, in these low-income rural spaces is so multifaceted that water is but one issue that um, a, a resident of Poplar or Tuleville um, or Seville is facing it's also education, it's also work, at, um, and food security. So all sorts of challenges. And in some ways, the drought is, and you've both also said this as well, a real opportunity for us to think creatively about how we want to uh, restructure uh, our, our, our economy, our society, our political structures in these areas so that we can have a more equitable and resilient future for, for the Central Valley and for these communities. Well, I, I want to pick up on that because um, the earlier panel uh, really uh, I was stressed, you know, this ag industry, right, agriculture. Um, and I'm, I'm in the school, Del, full disclosure, of who actually believe we should be protecting our farmland. At the end of the day, we all have to eat. Um, and every time we have development, we are destroying potential sources of um, food production, right? But how do you do it in a way, as we heard earlier, that you know, uh, there are businesses, people are depending on their livelihood, and sometimes development is the only way to ensure a future for the children and grandchildren of, of growers and, and other families. So, so how, how um, would you try to strike a balance, if, if you could imagine, where you want a sustainable, sustainable water in which we have huge demand. We heard from Craig, you know, only about 41% of the water is actually going ag. And as we heard for three weeks now, only 2% of California's economy comes from ag. Nonetheless, nonetheless, um, that's because we've got Silicon Valley, et cetera, et cetera. The fact is everybody has to eat, right? So how, how do we strike that balance? 
Anybody want to go for that? Um, so I do. <laughs> I do, Maria. I totally believe that everybody has to eat, um, but I also think that um, we have to be thinking regionally and coming up with regional solutions for food systems. And I, I am about preserving farmland, but I personally am not about preserving the farming elite class um, and their industry. I. I I guess I have to just be open about that, that I believe that a farming system for our state must reflect the ecological and cultural diversity of our state and our history. And um, that, you know, another thing to me about bringing us back into our history of our unincorporated communities is that our communities of farm workers have, it's not a coincidence that they're there. They're there to support the agricultural industry. That's how these communities began. and. Um, that's, that's something to note, that agriculture has been happening, but it's never been on their terms. It's been, they've, they've been there to support this larger industry, right? And now we're at, a cross, we're at a crossroads in history where we could say, well, could we continue on, down this path where we're pretty much holding these communities hostage to whatever the agricultural industry does? Um, should we continue this rhetoric of like, we have to preserve agriculture the way it is so that we can preserve jobs? Or should we be thinking you know, simultaneously about protecting jobs in the short term, most definitely, but also thinking about diversifying our economy to support those communities and, and even more importantly, diversifying our agricultural system to incorporate some of the visions of those communities who have been doing the, the, the backbreaking work of agriculture for so long. And, and the, you know, the heartbreaking thing for me in my work is that um, somebody, I come from agriculture, I grew up farming, and you know, my f the folks that I work with, farm workers, you know, they're, they're people who love agriculture. They love farming. And, but it's never been on their terms. You know? mm -hmm. And when we talk about building a sustainable agriculture in urban areas, there is often a discourse about sort of uh, connecting back to the land and learning, teaching urban people how to farm. People in the valley know how to farm already. It's just that they've never been able to do it the way they want to. So, I mean, to me, that's what a resilient food system looks like in building a sustainable civic agriculture in the valley is creating opportunities for those people who want to farm, particularly our communities of color and small-scale farmers, to be able to, to build up their, to continue to do the work that they came to the U.S. to do. Um, on, their, on their terms. So your, that last point suggests, I know that the Department of Ag has, um, whatever the program is, on new, new farmers of, Excuse beginning me? Farmers yeah, farmers. beginning farmers. Because what, what we also know is that the second, third generation may not want to be on the farm, but right. others may very well want to. So um, how, how, do you diverse, how do you diversify a rural economy um, um, so that there are more sustainable uh, communities while at the same time recognizing that the land is not fungible, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's, it is where it is. It is so it is. ideas about how you might try to bridge that, that gap? So I wanted to ch chime in with a, with a few points, and maybe it'll start to address this, this last question. But you know, when you were asking about the question of balance, I can't help but think how out of balance the s existing systems are right now, right? So, I'm from Tulare County, leading producer of ag in the state, in the country, and the health indicators I looked at from CDPH just last week said that about 40% of the children under age 18 are living in below poverty, right? So we're producing huge amounts, you know, in agriculture economy, and yet at the same time we have um, children in poverty. So there, there's something that's out of balance already. How do we begin to address this? You know, um, with the work that we've been doing with Be Healthy Tulare, you know, one of the questions that we've been asking, and, and it's interesting what you mentioned, Janaki, about people loving ag, um, we, we are working with some of the, that younger generation, and uh, they actually don't all know how to grow and farm. It's been, it's interesting to see because they're used to being told, clear this field. They know how to follow instructions, right? Row crops. But we've actually been challenged by, by being able to teach how do we know when to harvest? Well, if, if all you know is 
when to harvest because someone is telling you for your work that you have to harvest, you don't actually know the life cycle of the plant or the fruit that you're harvesting, you know, then there is a lack of knowledge that's already happened. So it's, in a way, we've lost some of that agricultural knowledge among certain generation, not among everyone. Uh, a younger generation, we've lost some of that knowledge. And so we're working with um, some of the young people and trying to like, okay, let's grow our food. Let's think about far worker cooperatives as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I mean, I live in an area where we have 14 census tract food deserts. Right? I just told you about all the ag production. I'm telling you about the poverty. We have 14 census tract food deserts. I keep thinking about the possibility of can we create some type of farmer cooperative among agricultural workers and be able to create a mobile market that can go into those food deserts in our communities. Right? And, and in that way, the food deserts have fresh local produce that's being grown, and they actually help support the, the smaller scale farmers who are growing perhaps in small plots of land or what might look like more urban models. Because again, when we're talking about farming and land and whatnot, you have to have enough capital to own the land to begin with. So in some cases, you might not have that either. So there's all these complicated challenges, right? So, so at least we're looking at it, well, can we think about worker-owned cooperatives, growing cooperatives locally with farm workers themselves so that we can support just the hunger and, and nourishment needs. We want to nourish a healthy Tulare County, and we have a Tulare County that is experiencing hunger, but is also experiencing high rates of disease, and diseases that are um, could be prevented through better nourishment and through better food. And so when I'm thinking about you know, this food system and how do, how do we grow it, how do we preserve it, how do we eat it, do whole seed to table, this is a language that to many of us in the cities, um, educated in the, near the universities, it's happening on a daily basis. It's not necessarily taking place in our communities. And that's where it needs to be taken place too. But it's that the education isn't always translated or because some of these community members aren't invited to the table to bring up those issues as well. So how do we translate the knowledge both directions? Let me, um, go, we're gonna have, uh, open it up for questions, but I wanna, it's very easy to not feel overwhelmed, but to see the enormity of the challenges, right, from the federal, state, and local, and power structures um, as they've been designed. So, so, because I'm a bit of a pragmatist, I want to ask each of you, um, from your perspective and with the organizations you work or, or what you've seen is, Let's assume for the moment that everyone, that we're all committed to having the kind of sustainable, equitable, resilient food system that's part of BFI's uh, um, definition, mission, and vision statement, right? That's a big vision. OK, so what do you want to see? What do you think would be a priority um, to get done, say, over the next five years? Right? What we've learned through this drought experience, we, we, a good portion of Californians now understand how antiquated our water system, water governance is. Um, but there's a whole lot. What, what, what would you want to see done? Or what, what lever do you think could make one of those leaps forward that could kind of change the system so we're moving towards that vision? Jenny? Jump in, yeah. So coming from the, the water world more more so than, than food systems more broadly, I think one of the big things we're looking to accelerate in the next five years, first is groundwater management, like I was mentioning, but even at the more local level, thinking about ways that we change who's in power uh, on local water boards, such that we are able to change the rules and change who is at the table and supported at the table and making decisions about how we manage our water resources, um, and that's a that's a that's an interesting challenge to tackle because it's not as easy as passing a state policy. It's lots of 
uh, it's, it's building up and supporting and doing the leadership development work with lots of um, community residents and community partners who are already leaders in their own right, but to put them in positions where they're able to have more power at the table when these decisions about our water and our food systems are being made. So that's that's one um, one thing where we're thinking locally and regionally about how we change who's in power, and and also looking to do that at the at the regional level with the the implementation of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. So we know that we need to be accelerating that um, and and strengthening that really from what it what was even passed last year, but also thinking about how in the process of thinking about groundwater management, we make sure that the residents who are facing all of these indirect impacts of our current groundwater system are participating and um, and at the table is such that even in conversations about, about transfers, where you're transferring water rights um, to from an ag area to a municipal area, for example, um, that the, the communities, uh, the farm worker communities that are going to have impacts to their health, to their jobs, to their water, um, to their food security, have uh, that there's a mechanism in place for them to be making those decisions and, and perhaps even some redistributive um, fund set up that really gets at this issue of inequality as well. So that's a, that's a smattering of things, but really thinking about how we change who's at the table and change power structures in these communities and across the state. Um, it's a really difficult question um, that I tend to grapple with a lot with other people who are in this arena of, of advocacy. Um, and I was actually speaking with Mark Van Horn over at, at UC Davis recently when we were talking about talking about this. What is really at the core of building food systems change? And we landed on healthcare for all people. Um, I think that's like that really kind of what it boils down to for for me is that when we look at the disparity uh, um, in health in the Central Valley, it, it has a lot to do with economic injustice and the fact that these communities um, have a much lower life expectancy. Farm worker communities have a much lower life expectancy than everybody else. And how do we really envision long-term political change for a community that lives three quarters of the time as everybody else? It's hard to imagine, right? So um, until we, we kind of get to that point where we have the, the life where people that our communities are able to live the life that's full enough to reach economic upward mobility, um, to be able to demand a, a, a better food system that's more answerable to them. Um, I think that's, that's really first and foremost. Hmm. Sarah? Again, a tough question. I, I really have to just really focus on basic needs right now. Um, similar to Janaki, right? If, if people aren't healthy, um, if people don't have homes, if people don't have just basic food and water, uh, there's certain levels of chronic stress that communities are have already experienced or already experienced working in agriculture or um, living in impoverished conditions. Uh, there's a lot of work that um, you know, Don Villarejo, who was formerly at the California Institute for Rural Studies, has done on housing and mental health conditions. And I just keep thinking about, you know, sometimes it's just basic housing needs, you know, just the basic needs. We need to start there um, to address higher levels uh, of, of addressing the needs of communities. So start basic. And I, I think what challenges, though, is that at the same time that a lot of those basic needs, they, they can end up being Band-Aid fixes, mm -hmm. which I think is when we look at the history of unincorporated communities, a lot of what happened in the 50s and 60s, we're, we're repeating patterns, right? We're repeating 30s, we're repeating the 50s and the 60s. These shanty towns, particularly hitting West Fresno County and whatnot, they're not new. You can go into archives and see photos of them from the 30s, from the 50s, and now you're going to see 2015. And, and so I, I think that what we've done historically has been really good at Band-Aid fixes. And a lot of times when we talk about basic needs, too many times it focuses on Band-Aid fixes for, the make, um, for those basic needs. Let's get more food out there to address the hunger need. Let's build more housing to get people housed. But we need to start thinking about both short-term and long-term at the same time. And I don't know if we're good at doing that quite yet, but that's what I would like to really see is let's let's talk about, yes, it, that our house is on fire and we have to put it out. Yet at the same time, how do we build a community that 
isn't going to entirely burn down. Well, let's open it up for, for questions. Uh, sure. Um, there's a microphone. Rosalie will. And, and make sure you introduce yourself. Hi. My name is Andrea Ingram. I work with the Executive Intelligence Review. Um, there's been a lot of uh, discussion uh, today from everyone about how to deal with the crisis and how to redistribute the dwindling amounts of water. And um, I mean, the, the problem is that the uh, many estimates are now that this will not go away next year, that this could be a 5, 10, or 20-year drought, you know, in which case no amount of conservation or redistribution is going to help, and uh, the, the state's just going to be depopulated. And that's not just bad for the state. It's the, the country's food supply, you know, it would be a disaster. Um, meanwhile, there are uh, capabilities in existence for things like desalination that could be done on a mass scale. These things could be built fairly uh, rapidly. You have also the idea of um, ionization of, of water vapor, which has, uh, has, uh, has already been experimented with and could be a major um, scientific uh, uh, endeavor right now. But uh, these estimates are based on the fact that these cycles have come and gone for the last thousands and maybe millions of years, uh, having going way beyond what any uh, man-made activity can do, but uh, has, has created a situation where you know, we have to deal with the reality of solar and galactic cycles and things like that that are now uh, becoming uh, so apparent. is there a, a question in that? Well, the question is, how, how about everybody getting together and, and lobbying the state government, the federal government, and so on to take some kind of emergency action, like what Franklin Roosevelt would have done or John F. Kennedy would have said, let's pull all the experts together. Let's have a crash program to solve this problem, to get all the scientists, the engineers. Well, let me, let me thank you for that question. I'm going to turn to Jenny and say, tell me how long it took. What did it take to get the Groundwater Management Act? <laughs> uh, yeah. Lots of okay. advocacy and many, many diverse actors coming together. And the drought, to be honest, I don't think it would have passed if we exactly. hadn't Exactly. So I, I, I just want to suggest, I, I think all those ideas, um, many, uh, we've heard many people talk about the kind of big investments that need to be made, um, but we have political will and mm -hmm. structures that may not be open to, to those, uh, and it'll take some sort of crisis. Question here? Yeah, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Rachel, and I'm a garden teacher at the Edible Schoolyard in Berkeley. Um, I really appreciate this panel um, reminding us about the historical and cultural context of the problem that we're facing here and how it's not just happening this year, but it's been happening for generations and generations in terms of the um, environmental injustice that these communities are facing. And I also appreciate how the panel talked in certain radical terms about how this is an opportunity to reorganize how uh, farm workers and other communities hold power in the state community. Um, but it seems like such a David and Goliath effort where these folks are not having their basic needs met and they're also being asked to take on these, in, these huge industries that hold so much power in the state and in the world. So what are some of your ideas for how that radical organizing can take place, and what is our role in this room to support that? Who wants to? Um, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, I'm happy to have um, Ildi Carlisle in the room today. Um, she actually is heading up a project that I'm really proud to be on the advisory council for. Um, and maybe you just say what it's called really quick. Yeah, Cal Ag Roots. This is it's a historical, it's a storytelling project um, that's looking at sort of telling untold historical narratives about the the agricultural history of the state in order to think about authoring a different future. Um, and I have a lot of great conversations with her, particularly about this, because we are talking about sort of radical shifts in, in power and who holds power. But really, it's been an ongoing. This has been a process um, since the beginning of time. I mean, from with our history of colonization of the state into what we have today, it's been a question of who holds power in terms of land, right? Um, and yes, it's David and Goliath, but it's, I think we're at a point right now in terms of agriculture where we're beginning to have the language institutionalized within the USDA um, to, to 
call out that they, we have what are called disadvantaged and minority farmers, we have women farmers. Um, you know, we, we're starting to codify these different terms around um, people who have been historically neglected by our agricultural system and who deserve to have uh, a voice at the table, um, and who deserve to be agricultural practitioners and who deserve to transition from being farm worker to owner operator. And I think now is a time in history to, to start paying attention to that and to bring the academic community, um, particularly you know, here in Berkeley and other UC schools that have been um, funded to do agricultural research, to figure out how can we best pull our resources together to support these communities of farmers who have been historically neglected and could essentially be the people um, to carry out this redistributive work and to really transform uh, our landscape in the state. Does anybody? Yeah, I might add to that um, and just share, share a brief success story in the past year as well. Um, and then kind of use that as an example of how we can really, how, how, we, how we do this kind of radical restructuring of power and, and systems in, in our state and, and world. Um, but just, so the community of Seville had gone without safe water for over a decade. It's a very small community, I wanna say like 74 homes, um, one school, Stone Corral Elementary, that is literally the poorest school in California, and it had nitrates in its water for, yeah, like I said, over a decade. Um, so the school was being forced to spend um, at least $600 a month on water, when really, obviously, it should be investing that in, in other things for the student's education. And as a result of several, like five to eight years of organizing by the Committee for a Better Seville, which is real engaged organizing, community residents meeting on a monthly basis, on a weekly basis sometimes, going and testifying in the Capitol, um, working, testifying and working at the county level. They were able to leverage some emergency drought funding last year um, and able to drill a new well. So they now have safe drinking water for the first time in many, many years. And I think that it's that type of sustained organizing by community residents where they are sharing their stories and, and supported and have the, the, the um, training and um, the ability and the opportunities to share their stories with decision makers and to become the decision makers at the table themselves, um, that, that is what's needed and, and what so many residents are already doing uh, in these rural communities to ensure that we have um, different power structures and that, that we're seeing community-driven solutions to the problems uh, the communities are facing. Sarah, did you want to say anything? Or? Well, I was going to speak to a similar situation. So my community in Pixley, um, you know, the, this is one of the challenges of doing work in communities is that many of our communities have been asked for such a long time. So what are your needs? What kinds of changes do you want? You know, not only is that done by local policy um, or government institutions, whether that is, you know, planning departments or other, other mental health departments in the local level, it gets done by researchers as well. And so we're living in communities that are basically tired of being asked questions because they feel they've been saying the same thing for so long and seeing so little change. And so one of the things that I would really like to urge in terms of the groups here is when you're going out and you're doing work in our communities, please do your research on who's in those communities, right? Um, trying to figure out who's doing what and where. What kind of work is being done? Because that can actually help deplete an already exhausted community from having to repeat what they've been repeating over and over again. And in my community, you know, one of the, this came up so many times, you know, we have we, incomplete streets, we don't have sidewalks, we don't have street lights, the, you go walking, you try to go walking for health and you get chased and mauled by dogs, you know, whatever it might be, these are unsafe streets. and. Um, you know, it's been a challenge. We only recently got in my community our first four-way stop sign. Right? We're talking about small places like this. And that was a big deal. We'd actually had our board of supervisor come down a year and a half prior to getting that stop sign. And, and people were already at a stage where they were tired of like, oh, we've been going at this for so long. And then we get everyone asking us the same thing. And just having, uh, you know, for us doing advocacy work in the community is saying, you know, well, 
you know, sort of this is the process and this is what we have to explain. The challenge for us as well, too, is that some of our residents come from places where there is a lack of trust to the government, right? And, um, and so that also plays a role into why people aren't open or perhaps um, are mistrustful of change coming. And so I would start there, you know, learn about the community, do some research, do some recon, connect to the community-based organizations that might possibly be intersecting with your, with your topic, because I think otherwise we're going to be exhausting and tiring these communities and getting nowhere. Draw that out just one more second. And we just really appreciate that you had asked what the academic community can do to support these efforts. And just you know, briefly, the Central Valley is ground zero for a lot of what we're talking about in terms of agricultural change, agriculture in general, agricultural sciences. And so it's it's just odd to like have the center of knowledge production out on the coast. Like we should kind of bring those conversations into the valley and not only do the research prior, but actually hold convenings like this. It's a very exciting time to be a part of food systems um, study. Let's bring it out to Fresno. There, and then there, and then there. OK. And then I'll go to this side of the room. Sorry. OK. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Hi there. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. My name is Rob McPherson. I'm from Australia. And uh, we got a lot of droughts. And uh, I come from a company called Organic Culture, and I just wanted to share briefly and then ask a question to the lady that was speaking mainly on water. We did go down a desalination plant route for Victoria and New South Wales. Uh, the, the drought broke literally the month before it was finished, and it saddled us with a $250 million a quarter debt uh, to the state. So we thought it was a good idea. We probably still think it's a good idea in anticipation of the next drought, but it took too long to build and it turned up too late and it was way too costly and now we have a debt because of it, right? The other question is in traveling around Los Angeles and San Francisco, I'm amazed to see, and I'm gonna be frank about this, the incredible lake of water in your toilet systems. And I don't understand that because in our country, we use every opportunity to conserve water grey water systems, and we had an, an extensive water tank rebate and toilet rebates. We had all these rebates to alter the consumer's behaviour. And I just haven't seen that. And I'm, am I missing it or I'm wondering why? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Jenny? Um, to, your, to your second question about rebates and conservation incentives, that's actually something that was just announced um, in the governor's executive order and, and some, a new legislative packet, package um, a, a couple of weeks ago. And I think that is a real step in the right direction for California as a whole. One question that I really have for the communities we work with um, is that these, or what the line of thinking that that leads me down um, is that these communities have been at the forefront of conserving water for years. And even asking them to conserve more water is, is in my mind, somewhat of a very unfair injustice. Um, so that's, that's one thing. It's thinking how we learn from communities that have been doing such a good job using the limited uh, safe water that they have for a long time. But the other question is with these new rebate programs, um, when you have, it's, it's often, so it's like, um, say you even get $50 back on a new washing machine, a high efficiency washing machine. You still have to put out the upfront cost of, I don't actually know off the top of my head, but $500 for a new washing machine um, or a new dishwasher. And in the communities we work with, that's often not an expense you can just shell out. So um, I think in thinking about the, the, the great new resources that are available at the state level, we need to think about how we target them so that they're re reaching the communities that are most impacted. And, um, and from my perspective, it seems unlikely that some of the rebate programs we're discussing are going to have a huge impact in the communities, um, the, t the low income communities we're working with. And there needs to be a lot more thinking um, from, from leadership at the state level about how we enforce the new con conservation um, guidelines and restrictions as well as the programs to achieve conservation efficiency in ways that recognize the, the unique circumstances of low income rural communities. There, right there. I was going to grab some water, but I think I can make it. Um, <laughs> hi, my name is Leah Renwick. I'm, I currently work for an almond ranch out in Den the Denaire area, um, but I'm from Tuolumne County. The Stanislaus and Tuolumne rivers from, run through our county, give water to a lot of irrigation districts in the valley. We've been on mandatory restrictions for about 16 months now, but nothing near what you guys are describing. Um, my question has to do 
with what what is the potential role of the big wholesale buyers, distributors, supermarkets in providing long or short-term solutions in terms of helping provide housing, water, food to farm workers, whether through paying more to farmers so that farmers can pass on that extra penny to farm workers or through partnering with nonprofits or government agencies. Like, what, what is the role of the rest of the supply chain and the farmers to a certain extent, but especially the, the rest of the supply chain? Mm -hmm. I would say it's an excellent question. I actually haven't heard of any any discussion at all of thinking about how the rest of the supply chain could feed I, into basic I can, needs. I can but, actually, yeah. there are, oh, I can't remember the equitable the initiative. The equitable food initiative that is attempting to actually put pressure on some of the big retailers. So I know that there uh, is an ongoing, some progress with, for example, Costco. Um, less so with some of the other uh, major retailers. So there are folks thinking, and Oxfam had been part of, of that effort as well. And, and do you want to speak to that a little bit? Sure. Um, as a matter of fact, we're engaged in a research project in partnership with some folks here. Is Ron here? No, he has to be. <coughs> oh, there you are. Oh, Ron. Okay. So, yeah, no, I should pass it on to Ron. I didn't know you were still here. <laughs> Chief researcher on the Equitable Food Initiative. Okay. I'm not, I'm not with them though, and I'm not I'm not an expert. Um, but basically, it's another certification program. So they're certifying farms right, right. on three Pass criteria, us. which are good farm labor conditions, um, low pesticide use, and food safety. Um, and it's actually they just started marketing their products in Costco. Costco has been very supportive of their work, right. and it's very exciting. Um, but I think Maria, I think the. Um, the group that came to my mind as you were talking about that is the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, yeah. which is actually pressuring very large retailers to pay a penny more per pound for tomatoes, and that money is going to the farm workers. And that's been, you know, it's been very successful. I don't think it's creating a huge change in people's standard of living, although, I, you know, in some cases, I think it's doubling people's daily wages, which, again, doubling is not a lot when you're starting with not a lot. But um, it's been very effective, and I think it's, a, it's an exciting model. So. So I think that that comment was um, that, that it shows other places to put put pressure to as we transform. I think sometimes in this work, what happens is we get fixated on a particular thing and lose sight of the fact that there may be other places to to bring about change. Could I just add one other thing? Is that um, that the the Equitable Food Initiative clearly doesn't address water issues per se or you know, food insecurity issues, but it's just at least addressing wages and good conditions. Right. And right. I should also mention that the research project in which we're um, involved um, is, and which Ron is pursuing, is looking at this um, as a business, making the business case for good labor practices. Right. So it's not so much pressuring per se, but it's actually engaging. It, and excuse me if I'm not getting it quite right, um, but Ron, but, but, um, but the Equitable Food Initiative is actually collaborating with the supply chain to right. really get, um, you know, big buyers to buy into this. And I mean, whether they actually stick with it is an, another question. But at this point, they're experimenting and you know really um, engaged in collaborating in this process. So, um, if I could talk more about the Fair Labor Association that came out of the garment sweatshops, because that's what this is modeled on. But anyway, we have a couple more time for a couple more. Right here in front, Rosal Rosalie? And, and you were waiting back there, right? OK. Yeah. OK, so one, two, three. But what about this side? <laughs> is it my turn? Yeah. OK. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ildi Carlisle Cummins. I work for the California Institute for Rural Studies. Thanks for the shout out, Jonaki, for this project that I'm launching called Cal Ag Roots. Um, my question is um, for all three of you, but um, a comment that you made early on, Jenny, um, sparked an idea or a thought about a potential either point of tension or maybe a place of common ground between the first panel and this panel. Um, I, Renata um, mentioned so, towards the end of her comments, I think, that a, di a distributed water storage system, instead of investing in large water storage projects but thinking about a distributed water storage system, might be a sustainable solution or a path for us to move forward. 
But then, Jenny, I heard you comment that some of the smallest water systems that are sort of off the grid and that have you know, 15 households or less are actually the most vulnerable. So I wonder, um, you know, are there different priorities that we're thinking about when we think about sustainable systems, if we're thinking about ag or natural resource management versus households and people? Um, or are, is there any kind of common ground there in terms of thinking about a centralized water system in an arid state and um, solutions for, for managing that and moving forward? Um, I'm going to ask you to kind of keep your yeah. comments brief so that we have time for a couple more questions. Yeah, I'm happy to talk more afterwards. Just briefly, um, I think the like small water systems I was describing are, are residential water mm -hmm. systems, which are rather different from what I understood Renata to be sure. describing. And I think when we think about how storage funds from Pop One or the water bond should be used, we're thinking a lot about groundwater storage, which would have a, a pretty great impact if we had um, better management of both quality and quantity for those, those small systems, but um, definitely opportunities for, for learning in terms of how we build resiliency into these small systems. Anybody, anyone else? Okay. Rosalie? It was right back there. She's, yeah, there she is. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Um, and I was just wondering, in what ways do you see changes in immigration and agricultural labor laws having a meaningful impact for these communities? <laughs> It's my question. <laughs> I was waiting for that one, but yeah, it's only spent the last 10 years trying to get immigration reform. I, I think one of the things that wasn't said, but should be very obvious if, if, you're, if, if you're unaware of it, is part of what makes these populations so vulnerable is, is the absence of legal status. And uh, depending on who does the survey, um, anywhere between 65, 70 percent, maybe more of the workforce, especially in fruit and vegetables, but other crops as well, are undocumented. So the, the short answer is immigration reform, some type of legal status, um, would in fact, uh, should have some positive impact on the livelihoods of farm workers. But what we also need to recognize that for uh, the students here who wrote a paper about the, the fact is ag work has been diminished as as an occupation so that whether you start from slavery to now ag workers are all just always treated at the lowest of the lowest so what happens if we get immigration reform we're going to still need a workforce, and as I like to say, there are plenty of Americans. There is no way in the world someone with legal status and, I don't know, high school education is going to go out in the fields and work for minimum wage. And so then you have to think about what's the workforce in the future and what are those protections. So I'll, I'll shut up there and we can talk after. Uh, <laughs> there was a question here, and I, oh, good. And Nina can have the last word. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Eric Kuderman, retired FAO. I spent my career really looking at rural poverty. That's been my passion. And it was interesting to have this discussion because you come from almost like curative medicine. You're really focused at the, the patient that is needs to be healed right now. You, you're, that's where your focus is. And you're looking a little beyond that at some of the regulatory aspects and the, and the more public health domain, if we use that analog. I think it's very interesting, and I think the dialogue reminded me of my, my favorite book, which is uh, The Malagrill Beanfield War by John mm -hmm. Nichols, and mm -hmm. the, the, the tensions that emerge from this, and that you see it here in this discussion. But one thing that I thought, if you think of the longer term, one of the things I think is, has to be part of the solution is serious investment in education. And I didn't hear that, and I don't think if you don't address that, the people will be living on the margins forever, and it's not, being is in rural poverty is not a glorious thing to do. And so a lot of people need, we have a urbanization phenomenon here and it will continue, but how do you do it in a, taking care of the immediate needs and help people move into different livelihoods? And so I thought that should be discussed, thank you. I, uh, yeah, I was like, well, let's have another <laughs> seminar. I, I'd love to talk to you about that. Um, Nina, you can have the last word. 
Last Real question. Uh, Nina Ichikawa from Berkeley Food Institute. And I just wanted to see if any of the panelists, what you thought about the role of government. We talked about shifting the paradigm previously of um, uh, farm, farm work to become honorable, going from stigma to become honorable. And I think about how the West has been settled with this idea of lawlessness and separation from government. And yet for, you know, for instance, civil rights legislation, some of us see certain parts of government as being really helped to level the playing field. So how do you see an ideal role of either state or federal or local government in, in helping to, to right some of these problems we've talked about? Um, that's a very interesting question for the Central Valley since um, this lawlessness that you're speaking of, that rhetoric has been hijacked by the Tea Party. And um, that's what you see when you drive down and you see those billboards that say pray for rain and no jobs, no, no farms, no jobs. That stuff is, has been put up by, by Tea Partiers. Um, and you know they're, they're, that rhetoric of the Tea Party is real, like they're people who are farmers who are reliant on water infrastructure that was set up by the state and land allocations are set up by the state. But now they're like, nah, we don't want any of the state in here. Um, so as far as like protecting farm workers and farm worker communities, um, I wanted I want to depart from this idea that like farm worker communities are reliant on the agricultural industry and 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 focus on worker protections in the short term, but really focus on how government can support those communities and economic transition out of their the current circumstance. It should not be nobody should be held hostage to the political whims of the agricultural community. Um, and so I believe government has a very large role in supporting uh, long-term you know, long health of those communities at, at every level. Any, anyone else? Just, I guess I would just echo definitely that I think that the government has a role in, in thinking of um, in part related to immigration and, and voting rights, um, who holds power at the local and state levels. Um, again, is just, I think, a real issue to contend with and, and making sure that we have people in positions of power and decision makers who hold these communities, who are either from these communities themselves or certainly are at least aware of the challenges that low-income rural communities are facing and are thinking about that um, and, and are, are thinking about the ways that government from the local all the way on up can, um, can meet needs and leverage strengths. So um, I'm going to ask Anne to wrap up. But before she does, I, I do want to go back to this question about that was raised about education. Because I want to uh, leave you with this thought that we can continue during reception, which is that has actually been a problem. Which is we see, that, it, it, and by that I mean is farm work is uh, rural work. And let's, we're talking about California here, but the, the um, uh, migration of young people from rural communities across our country from uh, also creates a great, great um, challenge in terms of workforce. And so we see, you know, what you said that you know the parents say, get an education so you don't have to be out in the fields with me, which we all understand as the child of a farm worker. Um, but it at some, you know. When we stress that piece, and we're going to have urbanization that's happening across the world, we still have this need for agriculture and rural economy. So how do we ensure that that very basic set of needs, food and water, are done in such a way that there's equity there too? And I think this is a very, very um, challenging problem. And, and education's a piece of it. But it can't be the only solution because it creates. So, thank you so much, Maria, and thank you all. That was really an excellent um, panel. <laughs> we really appreciate your time today, and it was really a stimulating discussion. I also want to invite everybody out to um, a reception out on the porch, and the sun has come out after a chilly day today. So we have some wine and some food for you to enjoy to continue the conversation. And I know there'll be lots of eager people to speak with you all. And um, there are previous panelists. I think most of them have stayed here. Yes, we've got Renata and John and Jeff still here, too. So uh, I know that Craig had to run. He had apologized. But I really um, am so glad that all of you came today. And thank you for staying through the second session, which I think was a, a tremendous compliment and extremely important to have, understand these social dimensions. It's really excellent. Um, I also want to remind you all, if you are following BFI events, our next event will be on May 6th. 
we're having a forum that's a little different than this. It's actually a report of the research grants that we, um, the seed grant um, teams that we support um, through the Berkeley Food Institute. And um, we'll be reporting on some really interesting uh, findings of their work. So if you're interested in that, uh, follow our, our calendar. And there's other events and activities um, having to do with food systems posted on our calendar. I want to also thank you, Rosalie Fanchel. She, um, she has been tremendously helpful in our organization, as always. And um, we also have Danny Lee, who's our communications um, manager here, and uh, Agnes, Agnes Zhu is out in the hall, who are also uh, all done very important work behind the scenes. And also extra special thanks to the California Endowment, who helped to make this possible. So thank you for coming. Enjoy the food.